the chief of staff of the IDF, uh, Halevi, he spoke to his troops, he spoke to officers on the northern border um, the other day, and he said that um, that he, he was giving them uh, encouragement, saying another Hamas battalion needed to dismantle. He's talking about the achievements. He listed them. Another Hamas battalion you dismantle, another uh, underground infrastructure, and get this, another un, another neighborhood where the population evacuates to safe areas. All of these push for the release of our hostages. So he's including the ethnic cleansing as an achievement uh, of the Israeli army. And the same chief of staff, Halevi, uh, released a communique to his soldiers uh, a week ago that said, which tells you really everything you need to know about this operation. He said, guys, we are not on a killing spree, a revenge spree, or a genocide. Um, do not steal uh, people's belongings. Do not take trophies. And do not shoot trophy videos, which we know is essentially built into the Israeli uh, uh, project here, these TikTok videos. Um, they're not individual soldiers taking a video with their buddy. We've seen, and you can see, and check it out in all of these TikToks that you see, there's dozens of soldiers involved. Um, when those uh, the women soldiers took that photo, uh, trophy photo last week that people probably saw in the ruins, um, there's dozens of people in those photos. So, And we also know that the IDF themselves, their operations uh, department, ran one of these snuff channels uh, where their soldiers submit the videos of torture and murder of Palestinians and then the um, mutilating their bodies. Um, all stories that, of course, the New York Times covered uh, that didn't exist, but of course it does exist for Palestinians and we don't see any of that covered uh, in the New York Times. So maybe we can go to number five here tomorrow because this is... Um, um, these are some, these are Yassin strikes. This is in Zaytun. We can see a tank's going to arrive uh, on the scene here and be hit before the active defense, um, before the active protection system on the tank um, can activate. And again, this, this was a casualty report that the Israelis put out just before this video emerged that said two, um, two tank crew were um, seriously injured in a strike. Um, and another soldier was killed fighting Hamas uh, in Zaytun. So then Hamas, within hours, released that video that clearly showed a sniper kill. Um, and then there, I, I, I believe what you're seeing there is what they said were the two tank uh, tank crew injured. And so, and we'll talk about this a little bit later on. But that's that's a strike to injure the tank crew means you've penetrated the armor of the of the vehicle. Um, and those fixes aren't simple. You don't just take them to your base and strap a piece of armor on them. Um, they're significant, especially that shot, which appears to be hitting the hull. Um, the hull on the Merkava tank is what um, is what separates it from other tanks. It's weight and it's thickness of armor on the on the bottom parts because they don't have to fly with these vehicles. Um, they can make them super heavy. But because of that, um, strikes like this, which damage crew, which are also difficult to train, um, at some point there's a, there's a limit to these. Um, so maybe we could do number six here too tomorrow. So this is also in Zaytun. And we can see the fighters here again, uh, carefully moving through the streets um, that Israel says that in November <laughs> that they had absolute uh, operational control over. They clearly don't. There's another strike on a vehicle there uh, on a Merkava tank um, also before the active protection system can, um, can uh, engage. And so these fighters are here in this video sitting in the bushes uh, waiting here for a tank that drives by I don't know how many feet that is, 40 feet away, um, well within, uh, too close for an active protection system um, to operate. And we're also seeing here, um, we can see that fighter there is holding uh, a Yassin 105. Um, fighters are still choosing um, appropriate weapons is the language that they use, uh, meaning that there isn't any indication that they're running out of these. They're not using uh, any weapon. They're using the weapon that's the most important, uh, the most appropriate for these strikes. And also these videos, as I said about the Israeli casualty report that matched these videos coming out, we're also seeing these videos from Gaza City released within hours of the operations. You can tell by the field reports 
uh, and by the videos that these are being released within hours. So there, there's no disruption um, to the media ops department. The fighters are moving through Zaytun um, because there's no operational uh, control for the Israelis, as we've reported throughout this war. It's a series of lies that the New York Times, among others, republishes to say 10,000 Hamas fighters have been killed, which there's simply no way 10,000 Hamas fighters would be killed. Even if you included the municipal workers, which Israel is almost certainly including, um, because they're killing family members of the municipal government run by Hamas and then counting them as, as Hamas fighters. Um, so maybe after this rolls this last time tomorrow, we can go to number seven. Because um, the fighting is also, uh, it's taking place in Zaytun, major battles in Zaytun. But Israel said that they've also uh, uh, taken over uh, and cleared Khan Yunus, which we clearly show is not the case. Maybe number seven here tomorrow. This is a, a strike uh, from an elevated firing position uh, on a Namer troop carrier uh, in Khan Yunus. And so this is one, what we're watching here and what we've been watching for the last three videos is one of 1,200 uh, Yassin strikes, uh, the indigenous produced uh, RPG uh, round and warhead that are, develop are produced as a clone of a Soviet weapon uh, produced in the Gaza Strip uh, and given to their fighters. More than 1,200 Yassin strikes against tanks and armored vehicles, um, and many of them that we know uh, penetrate. And that's just the Qassam Brigades. That's just effectively the National Army. And then there's, as I showed on the show last week, there's 10 other guerrilla groups that operate within the Gaza Strip that also have their own weaponry, not as much, not as significant as the tandem charge uh, Yassin warhead, but RPG charges. Um, they have, uh, the Palestinians also have Shawath devices, um, explosively formed penetrators um, that have been used against armored vehicles. Um, and so we're seeing uh, wear and tear. Now let's hop to the next one here, number eight tomorrow. And then maybe we could just pause it um, when we see the vehicle uh, that's right here. Pause it maybe here if you can. So the question has been asked, how, how many of these tanks can you hit? Uh, before the Israelis' uh, uh, ground operation is impaired. And what we're seeing here is a vehicle that's older than any of us on this show. Um, this is a 1960s era uh, M113, which is a, 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 an aluminum armored personnel carrier uh, that the Americans created in order for it to be put on planes, to be airdropped or to be put on uh, boats and for sea landings, um, they're not uh, able to perform uh, under the, the pressures of urban warfare in the 21st century. Uh, in fact, in the 1973 Yom Kippur War, um, they performed so poorly uh, that there was uh, articles and discussion within the Israeli uh, intelligence and military industries about a solution to this problem in 1973. Um, in 1978, in the invasion of Lebanon and the siege of Beirut, the M113 that we're looking at right here uh, wasn't allowed on the front lines. They were just a, a battlefield bus, as they call it, that would shuttle the troops within a couple hundred uh, meters of the front lines because they couldn't handle uh, battle in um in the 1978 Yom Kippur War. Um, so maybe just roll it here tomorrow because the Israelis have up armored these. They've added additional armor that you can see on the back. So it's not as weak as the original vehicle, but it has absolutely no chance against that round that you're seeing fired at its back door, which is its weakest point. Um, destroying this M113. And this is a second one. I can't identify this one because they're pulling out these vehicles from storage um, that they haven't used in more than a decade. And um, just, well, these loop a couple times to show you that there's no way anyone survived uh, in that vehicle. In 2004, the last time Israel said this is the last time that we're ever going to use M113s in Gaza was in 2004 when in Gaza City they were hit by an IED and destroyed two of their armored vehicles, M113s that you're seeing there, and killed everybody inside. In 2004, a generation before the Yassin, which is a tandem charge warhead that would penetrate, as I showed on a couple shows ago, uh, would penetrate uh, 600 millimeters of armor. And that vehicle you're looking at there has less than 20. 
Um, and so it doesn't stand a chance against these. And in 2014, the Israelis called it the APC disaster when their M113 was hit. Um, and the, it, the IDF had to come out and say to the public that M113s will no longer be operating inside Gaza. But we know that they were used inside Gaza again, because in 2014, the Battle of Shaja'ia began with an armored convoy uh, entering Shaja'ia and being hit by an ambush um, in these vehicles, M113s. And the Qassam Brigades talk about um, stopping. The Israelis said that the, the M113 stalled. Um, Qassam said that they stopped the armored column and then attacked these vehicles separately. Um, but they entered the back of the vehicles, they opened the doors and entered the back of the APCs and captured a soldier. And at the time of the attack in Shaja'ia, um, the Israelis believed that they had lost many soldiers to capture in this vehicle. And that's what led to the massacre in Shaja'ia when they, um, they massacred the civilian population because of the stunning defeat that their forces faced in Shaja'ia immediately upon entering. So the question has been how long uh, w until the Israelis run out of these armored vehicles. Uh, and, and I think we're seeing the answer right now. There's absolutely no military uh, justification for sending these vehicles in. In fact, in 2014, uh, IDF soldiers uh, submitted to the, uh, the command leadership, to their officers, that they would not go into Gaza uh, in these vehicles. Um, and so these vehicles can carry... Uh, half a dozen, six to eight uh, people in them. And what, what you're seeing there is even if it's just a tank, even if it's just the crew that operates the vehicle, it's two, um, you're seeing casualties in both of these operations that aren't being reported by the Israelis right now. Um, and, and this story hasn't seemed to be picked up in the Israeli uh, media, which is... I, I think is, is is surprising to me. I believed that this would be uh, when this video came out a few days ago. I thought this would be a big deal within the Israeli press. I'm not sure. Maybe we're getting our answer that they actually don't watch these videos. Maybe we can go to number nine here tomorrow because we have a, a an old favorite here. Soldiers in a window uh, in Khan Yunis. It's an IDF force with their guns poking out the window. Uh, but they didn't put their curtains up everybody. this time. No curtains, though. Usually they decorate when they... Well, you can see they're sticking the nose of their rifle out the window, which shows them to anyone who's watching. Um, and so you see the fighters here climbing up to the top floor because they can access the building right across from it. And you can see the tan warhead on the end of that. That's uh, a thermobaric, um, again, a thermobaric warhead that's used against troop positions um, that you see as a fuel air explosion. And so again, to use the language they use, appropriate weapons. We're seeing them use the weapon that is appropriate for uh, that operation, not just any weapon that they have left. So indications suggest that the Israelis are running out of gear and the Palestinians have, we, we haven't seen any suggestion that that's the case. Rocket fire is down. Um, lately, but uh, there's lots of reasons that could explain that rocket fire being down. I don't think there's anything that explains an M113 being used in Gaza in 2024. Um, and also on this video, just to point out, um, Qassam is going back. So here we can see them again, walking up to a position right across the street um, and using a thermobaric warhead, able to send a cameraman and a shooter um, to eliminate that Israeli position. And then here we can see after when this rolls, um, they're gonna go back to the same spot and take uh, an after action report or to do battle damage assessment, which is which you can see there, the hole in the wall from where the, the round hit. This is actually something Kassam is doing, this battle damage assessment. This is something the Israelis don't do. Um, even the Americans, when they strike in Iraq and say that they assassinated a leader, their forces go back the next day to the site of the attack and try to get evidence that they killed the person they intended to kill. Israel doesn't have any of that. They just massacre civilians and they don't feel the need ever to justify uh, their their attacks with, an, uh, with a battle damage assessment, which is something that is a, a core part of uh, NATO militaries that the Israelis um, don't feel any need uh, at this point to um, to be doing, which is, I think, uh, a telling about the uh, impunity with which they they operate, that they don't even have to pretend 
um, that they're killing militants or killing fighters when they're massacring uh, civilians. So maybe we can go to number 10 after this here, Tamara. Um, this is a, an operation in Khan Yunis. And what we're seeing here, we take out the audio here to try to keep these videos online. Um, but if you hear the audio here, you're seeing a gunfight happening uh, in the distance there, straight ahead in the middle of the camera. And you're going to watch uh, a series of bombs detonate here that blew the cameraman um, back. But you can see it's a series of, of, of explosions um, that the, that the Kassam Brigade said was a barrel bomb. And this is something that uh, that fighters are able to do um, when they use unexploded ordnance, which we're seeing dropped on Gaza right now. Thirty thousand airstrikes, uh, thirty thousand targets, and we know that some of targets, by definition, have multiple airstrikes hitting them. So there's been more than thirty thousand of these, and there's a certain dud rate um, in these weapons. Um, and so the Palestinians are able to reappropriate that explosive material and set up massive bombs because you can fill the, the barrel up with as much explosives um, a, 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 as you can fit in that particular barrel. You're not limited. Uh, and you can see that against a troop position uh, there being used uh, in Khan Yunus. And then let's go to these field reports, Tamara, because um, yesterday, so that's what a barrel bomb looks like. Um, and this is uh, Islamic Jihad. They say um, in this message yesterday, they said, in a complex engineering operation, we trapped a Zionist force in a precise ambush inside a building that was booby trapped using an F-16 missile launched by the enemy towards civilian homes. The missile did not explode. Our engineers worked to activate it and detonate it in the vicinity of the Daula Junction, south of Zaytun neighborhood in Gaza City. So that was yesterday. And then first thing this morning, uh, if we go to the next one here, the IDF acknowledged uh, in an operation Tuesday, the IDF announces the deaths of two officers killed during fighting in the Northern Gaza Strip yesterday, raising the toll to 242. Their names are, and they list them. One is a company commander, so the overall commander, and then the other one is a platoon commander. And the IDF says that seven other soldiers in the Sabar Battalion uh, were seriously wounded in the same incident. Um, and so as the result, it says there, seriously wounded as the result of an explosive de device blast in Gaza City's Zaytun neighborhood. So it looks like we have confirmation from the Israelis of this Saraya al-Quds operation. Uh, they'll call it a Hamas operation, but a Saraya al-Quds operation to re-engineer, to, to reuse an unexploded bomb um, that's dropped on Gaza. And back after cast lead um, operation, um, the, uh, the Hamas government and the Qassam Brigade set about establishing an unexploded ordnance unit that went around and removed unexploded bombs from people's homes, which is a, a, a municipal service, um, but then using those bombs um, and reusing the explosive material in those bombs um, and sending them back to Israel. And so what we're seeing in this war over the last 145 days uh, is enough exploded bombs to uh, to propel a generation of warfare back at the Israelis. Um, and it's just, I think, uh, something that's important to note that the Palestinians are able to do this under the, a, a siege so brutal uh, that the Jordanian king has to pretend he's a special forces commander and push aid deliveries uh, from the air into the sea for children uh, to get. That's how strict the siege is. Um, but Palestinians under that with their own hands um, are able to manufacture a resistance uh, economy um, such that um, we can see, and we can see the results of which uh, reported uh, in these Israeli reports. So the Israelis are lying about their casualties. They've only acknowledged six casualties in the fighting in the last week. And on this videos that I showed you today, the numbers are clearly, as anyone can see, significantly higher than that. Um, but occasionally they do report, uh, and sometimes it's with these large attacks where many people's families know about it because you're talking about seven injured and nine uh, total uh, here. You're talking about many people communicating the injuries and it's harder to cover it up. Um, so we do see occasional moments where we see this acknowledgement. Um, but nothing that matches um, the videos that we watch all the time. So just to wrap, 
um, to say all these videos for from the last week, we're still covering the ground war and the resistance uh, on a day to day basis. Um, and so it's still going strong. And uh, I think you'd be surprised by that if you're only getting your English language. Uh, uh, if you're only getting your news from English language media, I think you would be surprised by that. Um, so there's the resistance update, guys. Thanks for watching this video. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, hit like, leave a comment. These engagements help us with the YouTube algorithm and it helps us to get around Silicon Valley censorship as much as possible. It does make a difference. You can also support our journalism by going to electronicintifada.net and clicking on donate now. Thank you.